so here, here we are in the blacksmith shop again, and uh, I'm finally getting around to um, putting the leather on my bellows, and uh, it's fraught with problems. So, uh, not the least of which, I've I've taken about 20 blood samples. It's, it's like trying to sew a sock onto a great big foot, and you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want me be using your foot as a model. I'll tell you the number of times I've done my fingers. Um, so I've got two more pieces to do on the bottom and I'm done. Uh, I'll show you on the back side. I've got the back side finished. So I've got this side finished um, with the, it's all sewn, it's all tacked, with the exception of this flap here that's gonna get sewn underneath the nozzle, or sorry, tacked on underneath the nozzle. And up above here, uh, there's a set of hinges that the top member and there's a corresponding set of hinges in the bottom. So before I tack that on, I'm going to put a layer of, of leather across those two hinges because that's, that's a pretty um, obvious wear point. And by putting two layers of leather there, um, it'll stop that wearing through as, as soon. And I've left that fairly loose here because of that movement. Um, so <laughs> ideally, this would be entirely sealed. And that's an impossibility, but we're trying to get as many leaks out as possible. So I've brought some slats here that I've, I'm hoping they're going to work. Um, they're from a Hackberry, and it's very straight grain. I don't have any knots in it. I'm going to employ my tray that I use for uh, making birch bark canoes. So I'm going to get that water heated up in that, and I'm going to boil or steam bend these guys. And they're going to be nailed over all those tacks on the center piece, which is non-moving, the top two pieces that move, flex with hinges, and the bottom two pieces that flex. So that, that once it's bent and, and nailed in, it's gonna seal that up pretty darn good. I hope, <laughs> I hope pretty darn good. Anyway, we're a ways from that. I still got two pieces to do on the other side, and um, before I, <laughs> I almost made a boo-boo. Well, in fact, I did make a boo-boo. So I've got two braces here now holding um, the top member the right distance apart. So about seven inches at the back for each of the moving members. But I had blocks inside. Well, I removed the blocks as I was stitching. That was all going well. And as I did the top one on the other side, I, I realized that I still had a block in there. And I was almost down to, I had about four tacks to go. And anyway, realizing my mistake in time, I was able to Wiggle my hand in there, get a hold of the block. I put these braces on first to temporarily hold it in place. So, and essentially this works like a heart. So it's got two valves, or sorry, it's got four valves, but two chambers. So as one set of valves open, uh, as it's pumped up, the other set, set closes. So uh, in fact, there's an old saying that, um, that the um, bellows is the heart of the blacksmith shop and the anvil's the soul, kind of like that one. Anyway, back to my stitching. So whenever I undertake a project of trying to recreate something from the 17 or 1800s, I, I think about my predecessors. Um, so, on the pr process of building this, I'm probably going to use somewhere in the neighborhood of 300, 350 tacks, give or take a handful. Um, but I went to a store and bought them. So if I was truly living in the 17 or 1800s, first of all, I'd have to make uh, 350 of those little guys, uh, have to shoot a cow and tan the hide, have to go to the forest and fell the tree, plane the lumber. Um, so yeah, I have nothing but respect for our ancestors, that w what they had to do to accomplish. Um, and, and this has been a big project for me. I, I should have kept track of the hours, but I've got a lot of hours in, in this project. Um, and while I'm on it, I haven't quite decided. At some point, I may suspend this bellows from the ceiling. And that would give me a lot more shop space. Um, that may or may not happen. For now, I'm just going to get it plumbed in. So once I've got the leather work done and my slats on it, um, I'm, I'm going to have to work on my tin work that's going to go in through the forge uh, chimney underneath the, the firebox, and that's going to this is going to be the engine that 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 pulls the train right here. Anyway, I think before I get into 
two more patches because my fingers are a tad sore. I think I'll pour a cup of coffee and tell a wee bit of history about blacksmithing in Canada specifically. Oh my, that, that feels as good on my fingers as this is going to feel on my stomach. They're, they're a tad cold. So a wee bit of history about blacksmithing. If we think about the blacksmith today as a jack of all trades, but if we, I'll take you back to the mid 1700s and, and they were anything but, they, they specialized. Um, they were gunsmiths, they were uh, edge tool makers, there were uh, nail smiths, there were farriers that shod uh, draft horses and oxen. So New France is arguably the first blacksmith to come to this content, continent, uh, predating uh, Jamestown and Plymouth Rock and places like that. And in France at the time, it was a gilded trade. So apprenticeship was very rigorous, uh, generally lasted three years, and, and rarely did anybody get into the trade unless they were the son of an iron worker or a really good friend of an iron worker. So it was a really sought after position. In English Canada, the first um, iron workers were brought over from England by the Hudson Bay Company in the 1670s. Uh, they shipped all these young fellows over to work at the different trading posts and forts to d repair firearms. Um, they were a little more involved in tools, but they weren't specifically iron workers. They, they were also involved in the fur trade at that time. So if we fast forward to the mid 1800s, things have changed dramatically. So all those specialized iron worker and trades are now being done by a single craftsman or artisan in what we know today as a blacksmith. Now, as if we think about the time period, there's a lot of growth in North America. Train tracks are being built across the continents. And as these new towns sprang up, the blacksmith was essential. I mentioned in an earlier video where often to entice a blacksmith into a new village, they would give him a free plot of land, ideally on river, so he'd have power to power his tools and such. Uh, they'd come out and actually build the shop for him and, and perhaps even build his house. So they needed a blacksmith. Everything they needed out of iron was made by that man and it was essential. But <laughs> what I find the most fascinating part of blacksmithing history in North America. I don't know if I've found any accounts, first person accounts in English part of Canada, but in French part of Canada, they often practice veterinarian medicine. And, it, and there are a number of first person accounts where they actually practice medicine on humans. And it, it was loosely based on some vague scientific notions they may have had, uh, folklore, um, old wives' tales, but I, I find that fascinating that they, they thought enough of the man, um, the smith in their town, that they would entrust their, their, their babies for him to doctor. Anyway, that's, that's pretty fascinating. So the blacksmith shop was not only a place where things were done, things were built, where there was always the ring and the anvil. They, they tended to be a beehive of activity. So they were a place where um, uh, men would come to hobnob and, and some learned to have their first drink. They, uh, they would play parlor games. They'd have their stags in the blacksmith shop. Uh, and often the discussion was around politics. And it's been said that often um, a person won or lost a political campaign uh, based on the banter in the, in the blacksmith shop. So another wee bit of fascinating history, history there. As far as how a blacksmith was paid, it was usually in the form of barter. Um, by the late 1800s, perhaps cash, but still often barter in the form of uh, farm or forest products. And the blacksmith would often sell his surplus. So if he, he was given lumber for a certain job and his, his lumber pile built up and somebody new moved to town, he'd sell them the lumber to build their house. Uh, and because he was influential and often one of the more affluent uh, people in the community, he'd often loan money. Uh, he'd loan it at interest, of course. To, to give you an idea of the scope of blacksmiths in, in the 1800s, by, by the end of the 1800s, there was approximately one blacksmith for every 100 families. 
um, the average between three and five blacksmiths per village across Canada. And I suspect those numbers would be pretty comparable in, in the United States at the same time. So this is a what goes around comes around story. So we get into the 1900s, the Industrial Revolution's at its height. Um, the blacksmiths having to adapt to cast steel, cast iron. Um, things were made by machines that they once made on the anvil. Like they've got nail making machines, they've got screw making machines. So, so he, ha he has to adapt, but he can only do that so long and eventually he's phased out. So the come around part of the story is today there's a real uh, uh, strong resurgence um, with the trade, the blacksmith trade. We have these artisans all, all over the world that are, are, are practicing the skills of the old days. And in the, in the province of Ontario where I live, I've had the privilege of meeting some of what I consider the best. So I've had Bo Beckett, um, Ryan Belanger, Chris Johnston, Lloyd Johnston. The, these people are, are, in my opinion, like I said, some of the best. And, and they're keeping those old skills alive. Anyway, I've, uh, I could talk all day. <laughs> and uh, that isn't going to get my bellows done, so I best get back at it. That's the last tack, right there. Now for the moment of truth, does it work? I'm a bit nervous. Um, so the way it sits right now, there's literally hundreds of leaks. Until I uh, get my slats steam bent and nailed on, that'll follow all five members that are inside the bellows. But this is the moment of truth where we see if the if the um, valves that I built in this actually go up and down as they should. So even though there's a lot of leaks, if I pull up on the bottom. Uh, it's my hope that uh, the top goes up. Now, it won't go up as much as it, it normally would, but we'll see. See what happens. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Huzzah. <laughs> it works. <laughs> it bloody well works. Um, yeah, so... Um, couple of things when I get this all uh, there's some tweaking to do and obviously I got to get these slats on but for storage at night I'll be hanging a chain from the ceiling that will keep this I don't want this compressed the leather compressed but I don't want it stretched so I'll find it I'll put I'll forge out a little hook here and I'll have a chain that I can drop down and put that just so it keeps that uh, kind of loose and on the bottom I'll just put a block of wood in underneath it so when it's not in use that's how it'll be stored and that will make the leather last a whole lot longer. And as far as tweaking goes, they, they call it weighting the bellows. So I've got some bars of lead and I can play with how much I need. So it's the speed that, that, that this bottom's gonna sink. When the valves open on the bottom, this has to sink at a certain rate to give me the maximum amount of airflow at the, at the thury that's underneath the firebox. <laughs> Plenty of all works. <laughs>